Okay, yes, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hi, my name is Ken, and I'm from ADHD Ireland. Um, it's great to see you all, and I, I mean that most figuratively and literally, because it's um, obviously pre-March 2020 was the last time we actually did a face-to-face -face, uh, webinar. Uh, we have done loads online in, in previous times, um, but it's actually great to be actually standing in front of people again. And so again, we decided to push the boat out a little bit in terms of our doing our first face-to-face -face one. Um, and again, we've brought in Dr. Claire Lee, and we would regard her as a science superstar. Um, Claire is, is born from South Africa, um, and she has been in the US Department of Energy and Fermi Labs, um, studying the basic particles and forces that make up our universe, um, and possibly you know, understanding ADHD is part of that too as well. Mm -hmm. um, Claire is a member of the June collaboration, and possibly this is a little bit out of date, in the last two weeks, um, an international experiment under construction that detects and study neutrinos. And um, just to let you know, we will have time for questions at the end. Um, and one of the obvious questions is how many Fermi's are currently going through you as you sit in the lecture theatre here today. Um, she completed her PhD on the Atlas experiment, one of the multi-purpose experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, her PhD research focused on developing innovative measurements of transverse momentum in proton-proton collisions in Atlas, which I have absolutely no idea what that means. <laughs> Claire Say is an experienced public speaker, has been invited to speak around the world at places such as UNESCO's headquarter in Paris, and the UN Geneva offices in Geneva, and such events as TEDx, New Scientist, and now DCU. And she has been diagnosed in June of 2020, and has been amazed at how much more sense the universe makes ever since. So with that, we invite Claire to, uh, sorry, to join us, and we look forward to your lecture on quarks, the cosmos, I'm in between my ADHD. Thank you very much. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> uh, can we get the lights so that we can see the thing? Do a little bit more. No? no, we had it a little bit more earlier. No, that's the wrong way. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, you know what? We'll just go with it. Hi, everyone. It's really cool to be here. This is my first time in Ireland. Um, and it's uh, also so nice to be giving talks to faces and real life people again. But also hello to everybody who is uh, joining us on the internet. So, yep, my name is Claire. I am a South African particle physicist. I'm based at, look, this guy make, made it work. Um, and um, I am going to take you on a bit of a journey. We're going to talk about the very, very small. We're going to talk about the universe as a whole. I'm going to tell you a bit about my personal story as well. Um, it's it's going to be interesting, I hope. Uh, feel free to ask me questions as we go, especially if there's something on the science side that you don't understand. Absolutely happy to take questions uh, as we go. Um, and yeah, so don't be afraid. This is a science talk, um, but I hope that it's not going to be too boring and too scary. What are you going to expect in this talk? Well, I'm going to have pictures, and I'm going to have science, and I'm going to have pictures of science. Um, I'm going to have memes because there's, you know, no good talk is complete without a couple of good memes, especially some cats as well. There will be no equations. Okay, I'm lying. I couldn't resist. There's one equation. I hope it'll be okay. All right, so uh, let's get started. So one of the things that I think when you look at people from the outside and you see somebody, you know, maybe in a career in science or academia or anything, you tend to think of their path as very linear in progression. So, you know, you see from the outside, you see how the person, they went to school and they went to university. Hello, people. Um, and then they went, you know, then went, moved to CERN and got my PhD and all of this stuff. Um, and so from the outside, that's, that's what you see. And we will see through the, the talk tonight what this actually looks like more in reality. So bear with me, and we'll get to it at the end. OK, so why do we do particle physics? So 
if we want to understand the universe, and you know, it's a cool place to live, we happen to live in it, uh, it's, it's interesting, there's a lot of fun stuff in it, it's, it's a nice to understand the place that we live. So how do we do that? Well, historically, the way human beings started thinking about the universe was to look out at the stars. And they watched how the stars moved across the sky. We saw the planets, the wanderers, um, and we built telescopes so we were able to look further and further out and see things like galaxies. And this told us about what the universe was like. Now the universe is big. And when I say it's big, I mean it's really, 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 really big. It's so big that light itself, which is the fastest thing in the universe, light takes time to travel across the universe. In fact, the sun, uh, our sun, the light that we see from the sun left the sun, well, not here because it's always cloudy, but... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I joke, but it was pouring with rain in Geneva when I left yesterday, and it was bright blue skies, so you guys are winning for right now. But um, this, when we see the sun, the light, that the light that left the sun actually left the sun eight minutes ago. And so when, we're, when we look at the sun, don't look at the sun. So eight minutes, 16 seconds ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, when, <laughs> I'll believe that, when, don't look at the sun, but, you know, if you do, uh, but don't. Um, what you're actually doing is you're seeing the sun not as it is right now, but you're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And the further away the thing is that you're looking at, uh, the, f the further back in time you're looking. So the closest star to us is 4.2 light years away, which means that when we were looking at that star, we we're looking at what that star looked like 4.2 years ago. And so looking at objects that are further and further and further away is like looking back in time. So we can take a look at different things at different distances and see what the universe looked like at many different times in the past. Now, if you built the biggest, bestest telescope ever, the furthest back you can look in the universe's timeline, which by the way, the universe is almost 14 billion years old, it's, it's pretty old. Uh, the furthest back you can look is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And that is because at that point in time, everything before that, the universe was opaque to light. Light was bouncing off all the, the particles. The universe was a very hot, dense place and light was bouncing off the particles. But after that period, the universe had cooled enough for light to travel freely. So if you want to use anything with lights, like telescopes and things to look, look at stuff in the universe, the furthest back you can look at is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, and, you know, as scientists, that's not good enough. We want to know everything, uh, including all the way to, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And so to do that, that's where we need to go to particle physics. What we have to do is build experiments where we smash things together and recreate the conditions that were there in the early universe. And so that is how we can go from studying what the universe looks like you know, in these times to what the universe looked like in these really, really early times. And it's important to know this because the way that the universe behaved in these times directly you know, affected what the universe is like today. Just like the experiences that you had as a child um, still affect you and your personality and stuff uh, as an adult today. Okay, so I've structured this talk into three parts, and in each part we will learn something about the universe, and I'll also tell you something about my sort of mental health journey and the things that I learned on there, and hopefully that kind of parallel makes a bit of sense. So the first part 
I am calling discovering the basic building blocks. So what am I talking about? So in any science, I think you can break down any science to this question. What are the fundamental building blocks? What are the fundamental pieces and how do they fit together? Come on. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about it from a chemistry point of view, your pieces are the chemical elements and how they fit together, you know, form the molecules and things that, that make up stuff. Uh, if you are a geneticist, then the pieces that you are thinking about are the genes and how the genes fit together to give you the characteristics of the organism that you're studying. And from a particle physics point of view, we are just going down to the most fundamental particles of most fundamental pieces in the universe. So we're asking what are these basic pieces that make up the universe and how do they fit together to give us this? So what are they? Well, let's, let's start at the beginning. How many of you guys know what an atom is? Never trust an atom, they make up any, everything. <laughs> so an atom, they literally do make up everything. But an atom is, uh, we, we talk about there's a, there's a nucleus, a uh, made up of protons and neutrons, and then you have electrons uh, orbiting around them. Now, this is actually a terrible picture of an atom. Don't trust that picture either. Um, in fact, it's also very much not to scale. If you took the nucleus of an atom, and that was like you know, the size of a football, and you put that in the middle of a football field, the closest electrons would be in the furthest stands, like right up in the bleachers, and everything in between is actually empty space. You are made up of atoms, but there is so much empty space inside all of the atoms in your body that if I was going to take all of those electrons and squish them down into the nucleus, so squish them right there next to the protons and the neutrons, take away all the empty space, in other words, if I took away all the empty space, in all the atoms, in every single human being on Earth, then all the human beings on Earth would fit into a teaspoon. Wow. That's how much empty space is inside you. So, you know, most of stuff is actually just nothing. Now, let's zoom into the atom a little bit. So right in the center, we have uh, this thing called the nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of smaller particles called protons and neutrons. So they're basically the same kind of thing, except a proton is, is charged and a neutron is neutral. And if we zoom in a little bit further to the proton, the proton is not a fundamental particle. The proton itself is made up of smaller particles. And we call those smaller particles quarks. And the quarks are held together by things called gluons, because the gluons glue the quarks together inside the proton. Um, so that's, you know, particle physics 101 uh, over there. Now, did we have a question? No. So in, before 2012, if we wrote down the set of all the particles that make up everything in the universe, uh, this is what we get. So this is what, what we particle physicists call the standard model of particle physics. It's kind of the same idea as the periodic table. If, if any of you have studied chemistry, you know what the periodic table is. It's the same idea. You know, I can also add masses and charges and all the other properties uh, on, onto this diagram as well. I've kept it clean for, uh, to, for simplicity for now. But the way that I've organized this picture is the outer ring, I have the matter particles. So these are particles that make up stuff. So the red ones, those are the quarks. So you have U and D, which stands for up and down. Um, and they are the two quarks that you get, you know, making up uh, a proton. You get two ups and a down. And we've also got some other quarks called uh, C is for charm, T is for top, S is for strange, and B is for bottom or beauty, depending on which one you like. Um, and then 
the green line are the leptons. So here, here's E, our friend the electron, and the electron has two cousins called a muon and a, I mean, I'm just saying these names, you don't have to remember them. Um, the electron has, has cousins called a muon and a tau, which are just like heavier versions of it. And we have neutrinos as well, which are uh, you know, also cousins with the, uh, to the electrons in the muons and the tau, but, but neutral, so they don't have electric charge. So that's the outer ring, the matter particles. And on the inside ring, we have the particles that carry the forces. Again, in particle physics, everything is a particle. So even, even a force like electromagnetism, like light, we talk about this as in terms of little particles called photons. So photons are the particles of light. Uh, that's that gamma over there. Um, the G is our friend, the gluon, which binds the quarks together inside a proton. And the W and the Z are heavy particles that carry the weak nuclear force. They are the ones that, uh, that are responsible for uh, things like radioactive decay of particles. So before 2012, this is the set of all particles that we knew of in the universe and we, that made up everything. Um, but there was one problem with this model, and that was that in this model, all of these particles had zero mass. And that was clearly not true. I very much have mass, as I you know, can tell when I step onto the scale, especially after Christmas dinner. Um, but you know, from a physics perspective, we did not know, we, 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 we didn't know how, how to give these guys mass. So, Back in the 1960s, some very smart physicists came up with an idea of a mechanism to provide mass to all the particles in the standard model. And since then, in experiments, people have been looking for this, uh, this, this mechanism. And you know, before 2012, we hadn't discovered it yet. Um, and so as of about 20, 2011, there was really only one place to be in the world where we could you know, take the steps and, and hopefully discover this, um, this thing called the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs boson, which uh, was the particle that proves that the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs field exists. And there was only one place in the world where we could do that, and that was at CERN. So off to CERN we, we go. So in January of 2011, I got back to university. This is in South Africa. Um, I got back to university after the Christmas holiday, and my PhD advisor said, Claire, I have a proposal for you. How would you like to move to CERN and spend the rest of your PhD at CERN? And I, without hesitation, I said, absolutely, 100%, yes, let's do it. And my advisor was like, don't you want to ask your husband first? And I was like, no. Um, I knew that he was going to say yes, and so, you know he did. Um, but you know, also there's a little bit of impulsivity there. It, it's, it's. I don't know if any of you have ever packed up and moved hemispheres, continents to a, a, a country where you don't speak the language. Um, it's pretty terrifying, to be honest. But I 100% recommend that if you get the chance to do it, you should. I think the world may would be a better place if everybody could spend, you know, at least a year living in a country different to the one that they grew up in. Um, but yeah, it was difficult. So at the time, we had a one-year-old. So we, we picked up everything and said goodbye to all our family and friends, left everything behind, and moved to Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, it, was, it was difficult. It was exhausting. Um, you know, when you leave behind your support structures, um, especially things that you have been reliant on, even without realizing that you're reliant on it, things get very difficult. And you know, we, we moved over. Um, we, I, on, I was on a student you know, salary, which you know, is almost nothing. My husband spent the first six months being a stay-at-home dad, which he said was the hardest job that he's ever done in his life. Uh, then then um, my son went, uh, was able to get into a, a crash, and my husband started working at CERN too. Um, but, you know, at this time, I didn't know about ADHD, I didn't know about anything, 
and being thrown into this different world where suddenly you have to do so much more yourself was honestly completely uh, tiring and um, yeah, you know, I went through all of these, these burnouts and, and stuff. But you know, you push on. That's the thing, you know, when, especially when you're a parent, you have no, you, you, just, you just keep going, right? One foot in front of the other. And there we were at CERN, which was, is an amazing place to be. CERN is home to the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer long tunnel, 100 meters underground, crosses the border between France and Switzerland. And inside this tunnel are more than 9,000 magnets. Here's a picture of the magnets. There are more than 9,000 magnets all the way around this tunnel. And some of the magnets, their only job is to you know, keep the protons going around in a circle. And other magnets are there to focus the beam and to keep the protons nice and tightly bunched together as they're going around. So, uh, and, and the point of the Large Hadron Collider is to take protons, accelerate them to 99.9999991% the speed of the light. That's very, very close to the speed of light really, really fast, faster than anybody has ever accelerated protons before, um, and smash these protons together uh, millions of times per second. And that is awesome. So I showed you a picture of a proton before. When in physics, in fact, in, in sort of everyday life, you can think of energy as kind of like a microscope. And you know, this is actually something quite familiar to you. Uh, if you think of light, normal visible light bouncing off me, you're seeing me. But if we increase the energy uh, into x-rays, then you know, if I stand in an x-ray machine, then you will see you know, my internal structure. Um, so increasing the energy is like a microscope to see my internal structure. And the same thing with you know, when we're speeding up protons, the, the faster these protons go, the more energy they have, the more of their internal structure uh, becomes relevant. So at the speed that these protons are going inside the LHC, this is what a proton looks like. So typically you draw a proton with three quarks. So those are those big ones uh, there. And those are what we call the valence quarks. Those spirally boys are the gluons that are holding them together. But also, at the same time, inside the proton, there's so much going on. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's quark anti-quark pairs just, you know, popping in and out of existence all the time, and gluon loops going around. There's a lot going on inside these protons, and that's what makes protons so awesome to use inside these these colliders, because when the protons collide. It's one of the quarks or antiquarks or gluons from each proton that fuse together to create something interesting. For example, the easiest way to make a Higgs boson is actually for a gluon from each, each proton to fuse together, and then that makes a Higgs boson. So that's what, why protons are these ideal discovery engines, because you know, there's so much stuff going on inside a proton. It also means that you know, when, they, when they collide, it's very messy, but we can deal with that. So the LHC is literally a factory of particles. And you know, as you can see in this picture, these bunches of protons come in, and every 25 nanoseconds, so 40 million times per second, we have protons colliding um, at four points around the LHC ring. And at each of these points, we have built these huge big detectors, which are essentially gigantic three-dimensional digital cameras that take snapshots every 25 nanoseconds of what is happening you know, inside that collision and recording the signals of the debris from these collisions as they fly outwards through the detector. So this is a little video of um, the, the process that goes, that, that we, we start from with, with protons. So 
we don't just take protons and stick them in the LHC and then they go. There's actually quite a, a bit of a process. So first of all, we take a tank of hydrogen gas and a hy hydrogen is one proton, one electron, so that's pretty neat. You stick it through an electric field and strip off the electron and then boom, you've just got some protons. Um, and a small little bottle like this will power the LHC for many, 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 many years. Uh, so then these protons go down a linear accelerator and into a little booster, which gives them a little bit of a kick of energy. And then from the booster they go into the proton synchrotron, which used to be CERN's biggest accelerator once upon a time. From the proton synchrotron they go into the super proton synchrotron, which used to be CERN's biggest accelerator once upon a time. And then from that they go into the LHC, which is currently CERN's biggest accelerator and which will hopefully be not the biggest in the future. Uh, but that's, we, you know, it's still a while to come. So here we are inside the tunnel. We've just crossed the border. Thankfully, no customs. Inside the tunnel, here's our proton. We're only drawing the three valence quarks because it, otherwise it gets too messy. And up ahead of us is a uh, collision point. And if we get, if the beam people get the timing and the focusing and everything just right, boom, protons will collide. We might make something cool. Debris will fly outwards, and we can rec record the signals inside our detector. And this is one actual event uh, that was recorded inside the ATLAS detector. What you see here, those little white lines, are tracks that charged particles have flown outwards. The blue lines show us something that didn't leave a trace in the detector. So uh, particularly uh, in this case, it was a photon because photons are neutral. And then they left a big bunch of energy. So that, that big green spiky thing there showed two big lots of energy, boom, going out on either side. So that's, you know, that's kind of what an event looks like. This is what the detector looks like in real life. And this is what our computer model looks like overlay. Um, and I'll, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just take a pizza slice like that to show you all the different layers of the detector. So we build the detector in lots of layers. And each layer gives us different information about the particles as they move through. So right on the inside, we have what we call the tracking detectors. These are detectors that allow particles to move through and just send a little signal, like a ding, 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 as they go. And then our software can do a join the dots thing and say, OK, boom, a particle went through the detector like that. Um, so the, the tracking detector only dings for particles that have electric charge. Um, so things like a photon, which is neutral, will go through without you know, sending any dings. Around the tracker, we put this thing called a calorimeter. The point of a calorimeter is to stop the particle and measure the energy. And it's kind of like, again, don't, don't try this at home, but uh, if you drive a car into a brick wall, bam, uh, then the bricks will go scattering outwards. And if you count up you know, the bricks and how far they got scattered, that tells you how fast you were going. So, um, so it's the same thing. Uh, we don't have bricks, but we have a scatter of light. That's what those zigzaggy thingies are over there, showing the scatter of light. We measure the light, tells us the energy of the particle. And then muons, which are these heavy electron things, uh, they actually don't get stopped in the calorimeter. They go all the way through. So on the outside, we have really big versions of the tracking detectors. So if we get some dings in the middle and then some dings on the outside with kind of nothing in between, and we can join those dots nicely, then we say, that's a muon. And then everything, we put everything in, in a really big magnetic field. And a magnetic field is nice because it will bend positively charged particles one way, negatively charged particles another way. So we're able to tell the charge um, of the particle. So from this, we can tell the energy, we can tell the momentum, we can tell the charge, and we can tell what types of particles they are. Um, and get, this gives us basically all the information that we need to know every 25 nanoseconds. 
So the first thing, I know this is a lot of physics. We're, we're getting to the end of the physics, the first physics section, so bear with me. Um, so the first thing that we needed to do when we turned on the detector back in you know, 20, 2011, 2010, was to check that the detector was working correctly. And this is one of the very first plots that we made, and it looks completely scary, but I'm going to talk you through it, so bear with me. And this is basically every particle physics plot, data plot that you will ever see looks roughly something like this. So what we do is on the x-axis, you have something that you want to measure. In this case, I am measuring the mass of two muons. So if I have two muons coming out of my collision, one there, one there, I measure their, their, their mass, I add it up, and I get a number. So if I get the number three, then I go to three over here, and I say, OK, boom, I've got one event. So I put like a little dot at one event. And then I look for another two muons, get the mass, put it down, put a dot on. So on the y-axis, that very complicated thing formula over there is basically a fancy way of saying the number of times I have seen something with two muons. And then what you want to look at is the shape. And most of the time, you see a pretty smooth shape. And the smoothness is just any random thing that gives you two muons. It's, you know, it happens quite a lot, evidently. Um, and the important thing are those little spikes, you see those little bumps. Um, and what is happening there is every single time there is a bump or a spike, what's happening is we're having, we're, we're having a new particle being created that is then transforming into two muons. And that particle has a particular mass, it's like the Clare particle has the Clare mass. If I turn into two muons, every single time I turn into two muons, then that will be the same mass. So I get a bump because I'm getting more particles at that energy, you know, representing that particular particles. So there's the J psi, this is the Z boson, the one of those radioactive ones, um, and a few other ones. So all of these particles we knew about, but it was important to check that you know, these spikes were in the right place because then we knew that our detector was working properly. And once we knew that our detector was working properly, we then had confidence to use the detector to go and search for things that had not yet been discovered. Cool. Everybody, does anybody have questions about, you know, physics plots? Awesome. So there'll be a test on this later. <laughs> so. So the, the big question at the time was how do you find a Higgs boson? Um, so going back to this picture, a Higgs boson lives for a very, very, very short amount of time, and then it transforms into various things. And one of the things that a Higgs boson can turn into is two photons, which leave very nice signals, bursts of energy in our detector like that. So what we did was we went looking through our data for events that had two photons in them, like this. And look, here's another plot. Um, I'm gonna, this, is a, this is a GIF, so it'll, it'll play a movie of how the data accumulated over time. Again, on the bottom, this is what we're measuring. In this case, instead of two muons, we've got the mass of two photons um, adding up to what is hopefully going to be a Higgs mass. And as we started taking data, um, you know, you see lots and lots of things give you two photons. So we've got a very, very nice, smooth, random, uh, just random background there, which is that blue line. But look at what is happening over here. Boom. That's a tiny bump. And you know, it, it was a very, very tiny bump back then. But luckily, with statistics, uh, we were able to you know, model this out and get the value of that bump. And what this plot is telling us is that there, at about 125 GeV, 
there is a particle there that is turning into two, two photons. Uh, and that is the signal of the Higgs boson. This was the discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, and the ATLAS and the CMS detectors both uh, had their result um, like this, very similar results, which was awesome because two completely separate experiments gave similar results that really said, no, this is not a fluke, this is something real. And that was really exciting because it was like the Higgs was the last missing piece in our standard model puzzle. So we were able to now fill in the center of this diagram with a nice big H that says we have a Higgs boson. OK, so that was 2012. And we had been at CERN for uh, a number for, for a year and a bit by then. And I was working solidly, um, especially, you know, you, you think that you're never, you're never working hard enough, so you're never taking holiday. I would work through Christmas. I would be on call, taking on call shifts for the detector. And it got to the point that, after, that then 2013 happened, um, and I had a really productive summer developing um, what ended up being my PhD work. And then uh, autumn came, and I started to crash into a really big burnout. And I didn't know that it was burnout at the time, because yeah, I didn't really know much at the time about mental health stuff. And so you just keep plowing through, keep plowing through, and it just got worse and worse and ended up you know, into a really big, severe, depressive episode. Now, I'd had depressive episodes um, previously, typically relating to the seasonal depression. So I'd gone to see our doctor a few times and, you know, I was let I need uh, go on antidepressants again, and then while you know in the springtime, sort of ease off them. But this particular time, he said, Claire, I think that you should go and see a psychiatrist because you know this has been a bit of a recurring thing. Uh, maybe there's something else going on. So uh, he referred me to a psychiatrist in France, and what ended up happening was he diagnosed me with type 2 bipolar disorder um, because he felt that you know, these periods where I would work a lot and then crash into, into exhaustion, these were the ups and downs of, of bipolar disorder. Um, so he put me on medication. <laughs> I told you I'd give you memes. It's so true. <laughs> right? <laughs> So he put me on um, this, this medication that is supposedly really good for bipolar disorder. And for about a week and a half, I had clarity that I never had before in my life. I, for, for the first time in my life, I started thinking, huh, you know, I wonder what I'm going to be doing in five years and these sort of plans. But then the anxiety hit. And I'm not typically an anxiety person, um, but it was really bad. We went skiing on holiday with my parents, and I like snowboarding. I've always been you know, into extreme sports and things. And I was standing on my snowboard on this you know, weak little blue slope, shaking. I could not bring myself to snowboard down. And I had to take the snowboard off my feet and walk down the hill. Um, that was the anxiety. But you know, it's, it's medication. So you have to give it time to work, right? So I, I gave it time and I went, went pushed through for a couple of months. Um, and I remember, I think it was about in February, I was trying to make a poster based on my, my, my PhD research. Uh, which, which should have been the easiest thing in the world for me to do because I knew this stuff backwards. And I was sitting in front of my computer and I literally could not form a, a sentence. I could not form one sentence in, in my head um, to make this poster. And I got so worked up. I would either spend, I, I, 
I discovered all of these cool tunnels underground at CERN because in the day I would get so worked up with anxiety I would go and like hide in the tunnels and like sit and cry for the day or otherwise drive home and hide in bed uh, with the blanket out of, over my head uh, and then drive back to see my, my PhD advisor at CERN who would pop out around in the afternoon to see how things were going and you know of course I'm like everything's fine I'm, I'm just you know I'm, doing, I'm, I'm going it's okay you'll get your results tomorrow um, and this went on for a while and, until uh, I think I, event, I actually also I called my mom-in-law and she flew over to stay with us for a couple of weeks just because I, I couldn't even handle taking care of my kid and everything at the same time. Short, long story short, went back to see the doctor and you know, he was like, oh, well, you know, let's switch your medication, duh. Funny, I thought of that. Um, so we did and uh, put me on a different type of medication which, you know, didn't give me anxiety, so awesome. And okay, you know, I started taking this medication. And this basically ate up most of the year 2014, which was supposed to be, I was, you know, the year that I finished my PhD. And in the end, it was only about September that I actually started getting back into being able to writing my thesis up and everything. Um, so, Oh, finally uh, submitted my thesis and you know over time just working through I was still taking the medication feeling a bit tired and I, I over the over years I started weaning myself off the medication um, because I didn't really it I didn't really feel like it did anything one way or the other uh, but I would still go through these cycles of, of you know work like focus I could get stuff done um, but then, you know, it, it, it costs a lot of effort to do that, and then you crash and you burn out. Um, one of the things that I discovered during this period was that if I allowed myself to rest during that burnout period, what would have taken two or three weeks to recover, you know, before I would start recover, was it was, was shortened down to two or three days. So just, you know, but being able to allow yourself to rest without guilt Oh my goodness, I was raised Catholic. Like that, that was, <laughs> that was a thing. So, so this, you know, this is how life went on. I, you know, I started easing out of it. I had it in my thesis. I graduated, um, all good. And then actually in, in January this year, um, I, you know, been off medication for a while and I, the pandemic was rough, man. And I started thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I just need some extra help. So I started thinking about medication. And then I started actually paying attention to the scientists that I follow on Twitter and, and stuff who were talking a lot about their ADHD diagnoses. And for two years, I'd been listening to these people and, and, and being, that's so familiar. But no, I have bipolar, so it can't be me. And it was really only in January this year uh, that I started thinking, you know, maybe, just maybe, this, you know, the, this is not, this is not right. Maybe that was a, an incorrect diagnosis. Um, and you know, the bipolar, with the cycles of the the burnout and stuff, it, it kind of made sense, you know, looking back on my life. Um, but it fit to like maybe 60%. Um, and when I started learning about ADHD, you know, because of course, as soon as I'm like, oh, let me learn about ADHD, then, you know, I learn everything about ADHD in, you know, two days flat. Um, and then I want to tell everybody about ADHD, including my husband, who really just wasn't, he's like, babes, st stop, stop doing this. And I was like, no, but this is interesting. Come on, it's really interesting. Um, so then I, I reached out and I found another doctor uh, and you know, ended up getting undiagnosed with bipolar, and then in June, uh, finally got my ADHD diagnosis. So, um, so we started actually with the question: What pieces do you need to build the universe, and how do they fit together? You know, from the mental health side, what pieces do you need to build your brain? Like, what are the little neurotransmitters that help your brain work, and how do they fit together to, you know, make you a reasonably well-functioning person? Um, and you know, 
there's our friend dopamine right over there and also serotonin who comes along for the ride sometimes too. So that brings us to part two, um, all the other stuff. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about life at CERN. So, because I often get asked, you know, what is life like at CERN? So this is a picture, actually, this is a picture of what was happening earlier today. Proton physics, stable beams, this is going on right now inside the LHC. Uh, we've got protons going. This is a picture of the uh, control room at CMS, which is one of the experiments. And uh, just a couple, I've got a couple of pictures to show you what life is like as a physicist. So, emails. Lots and lots of emails. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything else to say about that, to be honest. Um, coding, so, you know, most of the stuff that we do when we're not writing emails or reading emails is we are coding. Uh, and I actually managed to go through my entire career never having attended a proper, you know, coding course in real life. Um, so, you know, my main way of learning how stuff works is to take a code that already works and then mess with it, see what breaks, see, see what happens, and then, you know, learn from there. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, lunch, CERN has a nice cafeteria. Um, sometimes they do these theme days, like there was a Higgs boson pizza day. Um, so apparently we have two asparagus protons coming in to form a salami Higgs boson in the center and then some, some sprays of like olives and uh, other stuff coming out. I don't think my protons ever collided, to be honest, but it was tasty nonetheless. Um, meetings, there are lots of meetings. You know, at one point, the Atlas experiment had, they formed a meeting optimization committee whose job, I'm not kidding, was to have meetings in order to discuss how to reduce the number of meetings. <laughs> Needless to say, that didn't last very well, very, very long. Uh, but yes, this, this often happens, you know, where I get like, you have three or four or something meetings at the same time and whatever, you just, you deal. Oh, and it's even worse when it's, uh, you know, daylight savings and then the U.S. Is one, hasn't done theirs and we have done ours and then all of the normal meeting times are shifted by an hour. But the shift isn't always the same direction because it's whether the meeting was set by somebody who's actually in Europe or whether the meeting was set by somebody who's in the U.S. depending on, and then, then you either shift or they shift. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you would think that people with PhDs can handle this, but no. And then, you know, I love this slide because it really just summarizes what research is all about. This was an actual slide presented in one of my group meetings by a student. Uh, and, you know, the summary, there, there was a problem, I fixed a problem, there is still a problem. <laughs> so that's really everything you need to know about what life is like as a physicist. Okay, so I promised you one equation. Who wants to see it? Are you guys ready? This is, this is the formula of the universe. It's the formula that explains everything in the universe. You guys ready? Boom. Oh, that one. That one, right? Yeah. Actually, actually, it's not so bad. With a bunch of like, mathematical tricks, we can actually reduce this to the size of something that will fit on a coffee mug there. And, you know, this also looks kind of scary, but let me walk you through it. Every single time you see an F or a D, we are talking about the force particles. And every single time you see this little Greek letter psi, we are talking about matter particles. And every single time you see this Greek letter phi, that represents the Higgs boson. So, the first line, we have Fs with some mu's and u's, those are just talking about the, the number of the forces, that we talk, the uh, force particles that we've got. So the first line, we've got Fs, the first line is describing the forces uh, that we have inside our standard model. The second line, we have a D for a force and we have psi for matter particles. So the second line is explaining how the forces act on matter. The third line, we have these psi's and phi's, so that's matter particles and Higgs bosons. So the third line is telling us 
how particles get mass from the Higgs. And the fourth line, uh, we've got some Ds, we've got some, uh, some Higgs bosons in there. The fourth line is actually really explaining how the Higgs boson works to give mass to everything. So there you go. Now you know everything about the universe. Cool, huh? What if I told you that everything that we know of, of the universe, that everything we know about the universe adds up to a grand total of 5% of the universe. There is 95% of the universe out there. We have no idea what it is. All of this stuff that you see, you, me, the Earth, the solar system, the galaxies, the, the superclusters and superduper clusters and everything, like even the black holes, this is all in the 5% of normal matter. Even antimatter is in the 5% of normal matter. What is the rest of the stuff? We have names for it. We call it dark matter and dark energy. So 27% of this other stuff acts like matter. It, it, it you know, feels gravity. Uh, that's how we know it's there. So we call it dark matter. And we think, we think it's probably a particle. Uh, and 68%, the other 68%, is something that we call dark energy, and it, it's actually responsible for making the universe expand faster and faster and faster and faster. And we leave the dark energy up to the cosmologists to figure out, particle physicists, we focus on the dark matter. We hope that, you know, if it's a particle, we might be able to create it inside the LHC and see signatures of it in our detector. We haven't seen any signatures yet, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it just means that we haven't caught one of them uh, yet. But what it means is that here is our standard model that explained everything, but actually this is just one small piece of a much bigger puzzle. We don't know what this other stuff is. There could be, you know, it could be just one extra <coughs> particle, or it could be something that looks like this, with all of these other fun little things going around. We don't know, and our job as physicists is to try, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is, you know, see if we can, we can see, uh, or get hints even, of what the rest of these things look like for, uh, for the universe. Because, you know, it, it makes up 27% of the universe. We need to know what it is. So, as research goes, we start off with one question, and then in the process of answering that question, you end up, you know, finding another question to answer. So we started off with the question, what pieces do you need to build the universe, and how do they fit together? And we end up with another question, what are the rest of the pieces uh, that we need? Cool. Um, on on the mental health side, uh, instead of talking about what are the rest of the pieces, what are the rest of the manifestations, right? So in my, one of the things that ha was amazing uh, that happened when I went for my diagnosis is uh, for my first assessment, I got there and I asked my husband to come with. So, because we've been together for almost 22 years, so he was able to offer a nice perspective on, you know, me and how I act and everything as, as, as a thing. So I'm sitting there in my, in my um, ADHD assessment, and the psychologist is asking me questions, and saying, do you do this, do you do this? And I was like, yes, yes, of course. Uh, and my husband goes, but that's ridiculous, everybody does that. And I was like, no man, stop messing up my ADHD assessment. <laughs> This is, this, like, I'm supposed to be the focus here. And the psychologist looks at, looks at him and goes, no, no, they really don't, people really don't normally do that. And we had a good <laughs> chuckle afterwards, and, and she said, so, you know, I think that you should also come for an assessment <laughs> too. <laughs> and in that moment, it was like, this amazing thing happened because, you know, 
I, I'm, I, I always struggle with bright lights. Uh, so, you know, my husband gets frustrated because I'm always wanting to wear my sunglasses. And if there's a tiny little LED in the room that drives me insane and I have to put a T-shirt or something on top, otherwise I can't sleep. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the little cat water fountain drives him insane, but I don't notice it at all. One of the things that I realized was that these two completely different things that used to frustrate us about each other both had their roots in ADHD. It was like a common thing that was just manifesting differently in each of us. And this was amazing because, you know, before we would, you know, we would fight and we would, we would, you know, not understand, like, how could, how could this not annoy you? And why doesn't this annoy you? But now we actually understand where this is coming from. And with learning about ADHD and learning about the language of ADHD and everything, we're now able to, if we're sitting, chatting to each other, um, if, if you know, one of us is just drifting off into space, instead of getting upset that we're, we're being ignored, we can just say, look, you know, my brain is on another planet right now. Uh, let's talk about this tomorrow. And that's fine. Uh, so, so just having this this process happen has been been really cool, and um, yeah. So this is, yeah. You know, now when one person wants to talk, it's you know. Sometimes you know I just want to talk, and then you know my husband's like, "Babes, I'm not paying attention." It's like, no, it's fine. I just want to talk. That that's what I want. That's what I need to get out. I just need that experience. All right. So, part three. Finding a balance. Um, so let's talk a little bit about antimatter. Antimatter is actually, like I said, normal everyday stuff. Um, it's pretty rare nowadays, but you know we create it in in the in the LHC collisions. It, you know we get uh, we get lots of antimatter being produced all the time. It's very normal. Basically, what antimatter is is it's the same as normal matter, but with opposite charge. So you have an electron, and then if you have an electron, but with positive charge instead of negative charge, that's an anti-electron, or we call it a positron, right? And very, very normal, not scary at all, um, whatever. Now, the interesting thing about antimatter is that when the universe was created, an equal amount of matter and antimatter were created. And, you know, remember back in school when you were doing maths and you had the equal sign and, you know, you had to make everything on the one side of the equal sign had to balance with the other side of the equal sign. What you did on the one side, you do on the other side, right? So the beginning of the universe is kind of like that. Um, before the, the beginning of the universe, there was nothing. So after the beginning of the universe, if you add up all the stuff, it has to add up to nothing. So if we have a certain amount of matter being created, then we have to have an equal amount of antimatter being created so that it evens out um, and you know, balances. This is a conservation law, normal, uh, you know, this, is, this is good physics. So an equal amount of matter and antimatter were created. Now. The thing about matter and antimatter is that when matter meets antimatter, they annihilate in a puff of energy. Okay, so if we started off the universe with an equal amount of matter and antimatter, then over time, all of the matter and antimatter should have met and annihilated itself. And we should have a universe that is nothing but energy. Except we don't. We live in a universe that is very much filled with matter. We are all 100% made of matter. And as far as we know, there are no galaxies out there that are made 100% of, of antimatter. Everything is made of matter. In fact, just after the Big Bang, for every 10 billion and for every 10 billion <coughs> particles of antimatter, there were 10 billion and one particles of matter. And that one 
in 10 billion, so the, the 10 billion you know, annihilated themselves, and that one in 10 billion is what got left behind to create this room and you and me and the universe and everything that we, we see today. So what happened? Why, if, if there was an equal amount cre at the be created, where did this extra one in 10 billion come from? Well, you'll be happy to know that we have no idea. Um, and we've been searching for the answers to that question for a while. We've looked at the quarks, so these red, these red guys. We've looked with them and to see if, because if, they, there is, they do some, some hints where they, they break the symmetry between matter and antimatter, but they don't do it enough to explain one in 10 billion. And we've looked at the charged leptons, um, but also we haven't seen any matter-antimatter effect there. So the only place actually that's left, really, um, are the neutrinos. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna tell you about neutrinos, because neutrinos are really cool. They're really weird, but they're really cool. Neutrinos are tiny, tiny, tiny little particles. They're actually the second most common particle in the universe, uh, second only to photons, light. And the thing about neutrinos is that they don't have electric charge, so they don't interact with light, they don't interact uh, with the electromagnetic force. They don't interact with gluons, the only way neutrinos interact with things is through uh, the weak nuclear force, which basically means that a nucleus has to get really, 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 a, a, a neutrino, sorry, has to get really, really, really close to a proton or, or a neutron in you or in anything before it actually interacts. Now, remember back at the beginning where we spoke about how much of us is actually empty space? Um, what basically that means is that there are trillions of neutrinos just going through you right now, not doing anything cool because we're, to a neutrino, we're basically nothing. Now, a really interesting thing about neutrinos is that they're very tasty. No. Um, so, a neutrino or neutrinos, neutrinos come in, in three different flavors. Um, electron, muon, and tau, just so that they can match up with the electron, muon, and tau. Um, but when you take a normal electron, and I shoot a normal electron psh, out into the universe, if you go, you know, billion years down the line and pick up that electron, it's still going to be an electron, right? As long as it doesn't bump into anything on, on the way, it'll still be an electron. But a neutrino, if I take an electron flavor neutrino and I shoot that electron flavor neutrino out, it changes flavor into a muon flavor neutrino, and then a little while later maybe into a tau flavor neutrino, and then maybe back again into an electron flavor neutrino. And this is totally weird. Um, there's some mathematical reasons why it happens, but one of the ways you can visualize this is um, what we call electron, muon, and tau neutrinos are just like basically different combinations of, of three different layers. So like imagine you're making a cake, okay? And I make a cake with three layers, red, green, and, uh, red, blue, and yellow. Um, but I'm bad at making cakes, so my layers all come out, you know, wonky. But I managed to assemble the layers you know, on top of each other and flatten it out so it looks like a really nice, reasonably, like reasonable flat cake from the outside when I ice it. But if I take a slice of cake over here, then, you know, I might get layers that look like that. And if I turn the cake a little bit, so I travel around, and I take another slice, then I might get a slice with different layers that are like yellow, blue, red, for example. And that's kind of what neutrinos do. So this set of layers could be the electron neutrino, and a different set of layers is like a, a muon neutrino, and a third different set is a tau neutrino, but they're all part of the same neutrino cake. So as, 
as I'm traveling, you know, you might get one slice and you might get a different slice and that's, that's what happens to neutrinos. So why is this interesting? Well, in the US, right now, in construction is this big experiment called DUNE, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. And the plan is to make a really, really high intensity beam of muon neutrinos and to shoot them through the Earth's surface. We don't need to dig a tunnel because they just travel through. Shoot them through the Earth's surface and these neutrinos will travel 1,300 kilometers to South Dakota. And in South Dakota, we're going to build really, really big detectors to catch these neutrinos as they arrive. And what they start off as muon neutrinos, but by the time they get to our detector, they've actually changed into tau and electron flavor neutrinos. Tau neutrinos, unfortunately, are pretty difficult to detect, so we, we actually just focus on the electron neutrinos. And the plan is to see how, see how the muon neutrinos turn into electron neutrinos. And then we're going to do the same thing, but with a beam of muon antineutrinos and see how many of them turn into electron antineutrinos. And what we're hoping is that the numbers are not going to match. Because if the numbers don't match, that means that the elect the, there's a difference between the way that neutrinos change compared to the way that antineutrinos change. And if that's the case, then that might actually hold the answer to this problem of what happened to the antimatter. Maybe that explains how some antimatter turned into matter. It, ex it might explain an imbalance. And we're hoping that it's, it's enough to explain an imbalance of one in 10 billion particles. So we're going to end with a third question, because that's how we do things in physics. So we started, what pieces do we need and how uh, the, uh, what pieces do you need to build the universe? How do they fit together? We fig we, in, in looking at that question, we came up with another question. What are the rest of the pieces that make up the other 95% of the universe? And our third question is, how can we explain the imbalance that allows us to even exist in this universe in the first place? Mental health journey. Remember this picture from the very beginning? Things looked like a very linear progression. In reality, so this is, this is what people see, this is what you see on the media and on, social, on, on Facebook, social media, and this sort of stuff. But real life actually looks more like something like this. Um, and it has been a ride. And you know, I'm, I put a couple of question marks up there to where to next. I think the next, uh, you know, who knows what's coming next. But I think, you know, the big thing now is uh, having the ADHD diagnosis um, uh, is, is to learn more about how it affects me and how to manage things. Uh, and to go back to our three questions, um, how, instead of how can we explain the imbalance that goes on in our brains, how are we going to rock the imbalance uh, in our brains? So. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, learned maybe a tiny little bit about particle physics and you know, a little bit more about ADHD. Um, that's it from me. There's your thing. There's the microphone there. And um, so just want to thank Dave for organizing the event and, and getting us here today. And we've done this, as I say, in partnership with him. So I'm just about to thank DCU. And so just before we then the next thing is, does anybody have any questions? What's the barrier to get to 100% of the speed of sound? Or that the last two bit of the 99.999?
speed of light. So the question for the people on, online is, what is the barrier to get up to the speed of light? So the, this is, OK. You know the formula E equals mc squared, right? What that says is that uh, energy and mass are related. So the more energy you have, the more mass you have. Now, what happens with relativity, what happens as something approaches the speed of light, their mass becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. And then it really is to accelerate it a little bit more requires a huge amount more force. And then to accelerate it even a tiny little bit more requires an even much larger amount of force. And to get to the point where, you, where you're taking something that has mass to the speed of light, basically the mass of that thing becomes infinite. And then you, can't, you actually can't accelerate it anymore to the speed of light. So really the barrier is, is the fact that something has mass, which is why only things that don't have mass can go at the speed of light. Does that make sense? I think you had a question? Ooh, lovely question. <laughs> how do we make neutrinos? So it's a great question because, uh, you know, in the LHC, protons have charge, so we can use magnet, magnetic fields to bend them. We can use electric fields to give them a kick. A neutrino is neutral. So you can't control that little guy once it's, once it's there. Now, I've got a nice picture somewhere. Haha. -ha. So how to make a neutrino? Let's actually go to this, this little picture. What you have to do is you have to start with protons, and then you smash protons on a target, and you get a spray of other particles. And then you put those other particles inside a thing called a magnetic horn. That's what a magnetic horn looks like. So, you know, you, the, collision, the protons collide in there, and you create these little things called pions or kaons, okay? And the pions decay into muons and muon neutrinos. Now, the reason why you have this magnetic horn here is because the pions, the, the, a char, the pions have charge, so you can focus them in the direction you want them to go. And then once they're going in that direction, they decay and the neutrinos come out in roughly the same direction. Uh, and then, so they come down the decay pipe there, and then you put a big block in front, which blocks the, 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 the muons and all the other stuff, and the neutrinos just keep going. I'm just trying to imagine the setup to, to um, blast a pile of neutrinos through the earth across, you know, a big chunk of California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, not California, but uh, Illinois and Illinois. South, South, just South Illinois to South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's just a big, yeah, nice big magnetic horn and just shoot the, the new shows. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I think you had a question? And I was just going to ask, do you think that your ADT lends itself to your career as a scientist or does it make it trickier or both? So the question uh, is, do I think my ADHD lends itself to my career as a scientist? So that's an interesting one. The, the nice thing I think about, you know, research and stuff is, um, that you know you you don't have to clock in from you know nine to five each each day. So some days you know you might sleep for half the day and then you know, you know get into work mode and work for you know through the night or something. Not super healthy, um, but I think that probably in this sort of field or in in, in research fields these sort of behaviors kind of go maybe more unnoticed. Uh, like you don't, or, or you don't realize it's as much of a problem as it would be if you had to get up at 9, 9 a.m. every single day kind of thing. Um, in terms of, uh, so one, one thing I think for me is, is uh, my brain is very creative and I think in pictures um, and 
I, and I'm, I'm good at seeing like overviews and links between things. And I think that helps a lot um, as well. Get it, you know, if it's in a particular analysis, oh my goodness, and then you have to sit and then you have to do systematics and, you know, just do all of, you know, that, that's terrible and boring. Um, but, you know, then you're in the control room and or you're on call and then, you know, something's breaking and you have to think about this and phone this person and deal with this and fix this thing. And, you know, that's super fun, right? That's like, boom, yeah, dopamine. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, yes. What type of ADHD were you diagnosed with? Ah, so my type, uh, I was diagnosed with combined type with um, slightly more hyperactive impulsive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Cool. Like, so if the universe is like infinitely expanding and it's expanding quickly, quickly, yeah, then what is it expanding into? Wonderful question. No idea. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, you should uh, go and come to university and be a, a cosmologist and maybe answer that question. Yes, I'm sorry. I actually can't give you more information. Um, yeah. Yes. Short term. Um, Oh, nice question. So the, she was asking about the short-term applications. Um, well, you know, this is, this is fundamental research. Uh, and the, the wonderful thing about fundamental research is that we really have no idea where it's going to lead us or what, how it's going to pay back. Um, so, you know, with CERN, one of the things that has come out of CERN is actually the World Wide Web. This was developed so that scientists you know, could talk to each other pretty fast, and now we use it to look at photos of cats on the internet and, and, and other things. Um, and, but also, um, one of the ways that we do our data analysis is, because the amount of data that we get from the LHC is so huge, uh, it's impossible to download that data on my computer and then, you know, run the code on my computer. That would just, it's just impossible. So instead, we have this distributed system uh, called the grid where the data lives all over the world in different, different grid sites, different clusters. And I send my code to where the data is and it runs there and then it brings me back the results. Now, that is not just used for us. People use it for uh, cancer research and, and things. And when COVID happened, we converted um, a, bunch, uh, a bunch of our computing farm to run Folding at Home, which was like this, this program that actually helped uh, you know, model the, the COVID protein folds and, and, and stuff for. So, all of these things um, are, are sort of spin-offs of us you know, wanting to do some fundamental science and then needing some other things to help us do it. Um, but yeah, you know, I think the nice thing about, about fundamental research is that, to me, I think it's always, it's always going to be give you a positive return on investment in a really nice way. The only thing is that you don't know when and how that return will come. So, you know, if you're talking to a politician, people like to, people like to know specifics. Um, but, you know, if, if you're willing to just be a little bit patient, you're always going to get a good return. And, you know, there's the added bonus of maybe understanding, you know, why we exist in, involved. <laughs> Yes. Did you say that your husband was diagnosed with ADHD? Yes, and my child too now. So it's three for three in my family. <laughs> I'm just wondering, is there any comparable differences in your types of ADHD? Uh, I know women are statistically diagnosed later in life, so I'm just wondering if he received an adult diagnosis as well. He, so yes, because he, he was diagnosed you know, a couple weeks ago uh, and as a result of coming along to my diagnosis. Um, funnily enough, um, 
dear Gen Z is going to save us all because back in 2019, my kid, uh, who clearly has far more self-awareness than, than any of us, actually came to me and you know, was asking me, Mom, do I maybe have ADHD? Um, and you know, at the time, we, <laughs> we went to see another psychologist, uh, another French psychologist. In France, they do things very differently. Um, and so she spoke to my kid, and I mentioned, you know, we were thinking, does, does he maybe have ADHD? And she goes, no, I don't think so, because, you know, he can sit and focus on a computer game for hours at a time. <laughs> and, you know, with hindsight, that should have been, like, big red flag right there. But, well, not red flag, big, you know, nice, sparkly, neuro spicy flag right there. But, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, it's... The difference, the different, there are lots of differences uh, between us. Um, uh, for example, his ADA, we, we both combined type and sort of more hyperactive. I have way more impulsivity. Uh, he has way more anxiety. Um, and yeah, there are just you know, other differences as well. So it's, it's kind of, we're very much newbies at the moment and you know, in the whole learning process, uh, but it's, it's really cool to, I, I don't know. I'm I'm a scientist. I like learning about this stuff. <laughs> just very like quickly, we were just talking about language yesterday when we were having lunch, and we talked about neurodiversity, neurodivergent, neurodiversity. You have a whole new word for it. Neuro spicy, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the neurotypicals. They're neuro bland. Come on. <laughs> Do you know whether there are a lot of neurodivergent people working in Paris? Yes, uh, there are. Um, you know, it's one of those things where you don't really know, obviously. But uh, one thing, once I got my diagnosis, I you know, wrote some posts on Twitter and Facebook, and I had a number of people asking me, uh, you know, or just wanting to come and chat because, oh, look, they have it too, and, you know, let's, let's talk and share experiences. Um, and then there's lots of other uh, types of neurodiver uh, neurodivergences as well. Um, you know, depression and anxiety in academia is really high anyway um, for a number of reasons that there are papers about. Um, and yeah, so yeah. again, I think you know, as as she said, it's uh, in some ways you know it, the the environment kind of lends itself to you. Uh, another fun fact, my husband has aphantasia, which for those of you who don't know, um, he can't visualize pictures in his mind. So, you know, if I say, uh, imagine a banana, right? You can, most people can sort of conjure up a picture of a banana somehow in their head. Um, and my husband doesn't. And it turns out that actually a lot of people with aphantasia end up in IT, which is what he does. So, yeah. <laughs> So, yes? So, you were just saying you were, you were diagnosed as an adult, right? So, you were talking about how a lot of the stuff that was going on in your life at that time made sense. Yeah. But you got a, in hindsight, does some of the stuff from your childhood make sense now? And do you think if you got the diagnosis when you were younger, it would have had a greater impact? Ah, uh, yeah, you know. So when I got the bipolar diagnosis, um, I had that 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 whole emotional roller coaster of you know if only if only somebody had figured this out earlier, then I wouldn't be going through all this this you know rough times now. Um, so now once once it was ADHD, it was like ah cool you know I've I've done that whole thing already. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that pathway again. I'm just gonna enjoy it. But um, sorry. I completely forgot what your question was. <laughs> 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 I suppose the stuff now that maybe what you went through in your childhood makes sense to you within the context of yes. what you Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I was always, yeah, yeah. Uh, m more so than the bipolar diagnosis. Uh, for example, um, big emotional dysregulation um, and you know yeah, this yeah so especially when I was a when I was a kid I had you know have a temper um, and really have these big emotions um, which you know I guess still still happens to this day um, 
And that was something that never really fit in with the bipolar. Um, but I couldn't really explain it until ADHD. Uh, and then, you know, like there's, so it could have been like bipolar plus, you know, some borderline personality disorder and all of these other add-ons, add-ons, add-ons. But, you know, Occam's razor is the simplest explanation is, is the right one. And the simplest explanation is, you know, my brain needs a bit of extra dopamine, you know. So, yeah. Yes? That's a good question. The question is, um, now that we've all in my family been diagnosed, have we made any changes? Um, and adaptations. So, uh, let's see. Again, we're really at the start of this whole thing. But um, one interesting thing that happened with COVID was that when the school shut down and we had to homeschool, I really noticed my my kid struggling with the with on the executive function side of just having to sit down and work through the boring list of questions that the school gave them to do, you know, during the week. And it was, you know, it was completely boring. And my kid is smart, right? So just sitting doing math sums and doing French exercises was completely boring. And we struggled to get him motivated and everything. But in a way, that was good because we realized that um, the, the structure of the school that he would be going into for middle school, because in France there's like uh, primary, middle, and then high school. Um, I kind of realized that this, at, at the school that we were planning on sending him to, which was just the big, the general public school um, in the area, um, you know, he would be on a bus in the morning to school, sitting at school, you know, with, you know, one of a hundred kids in the year, and, you know, obviously in like a bunch of classes, but still, uh, and then coming back and just, you know, waiting to come home and play computer games in, in the evening. And by pure chance, we happened upon this amazing school in the Alps, um, which is, uh, he, it's actually a boarding school, so he goes just during the week, he's a weekly boarder, and the, the classes are small, I think there's like 20, 20 children per year, uh, and there's so much structure, so they have structured time for homework, and they have sports integrated in, so, you know, on Mondays they do either ha like handball or badminton or climbing, they did climbing courses and, and certificates, and then on Wednesdays they go hiking or water rafting uh, or kayaking, or in winter they will go skiing because they're right at the foot of a ski lift. Um, and, you know, again, and there's all these, these set times for homework and stuff. So my son knows that if he gets all of his homework done during these homework periods, then he's got no homework to, that he has to do on the weekends. And then he can spend his weekend time playing computer games or doing whatever. Um, and, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, how, how all these structures and, and systems help you deal with your ADHD. Um, and even though none of us knew it at the time, we still recognized that that would, was a good place, uh, a good school for him to go to. Um, so he's, he's now in his second year there at that school. Um, as for, you know, the future, we have to see how it goes. Uh, we're also still, you know, on the, the you know, process of figuring out our medications and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, the time that we take the, and everything. So. Uh, it's uh, ask me again in a year. I'll come back to Dublin and you know I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, sorry. No. Okay. Then it's you. Then it's you. Yeah. Orange dude. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, sorry. Imposters. Um, um, uh, in CERN, are you deprived of daylight? And if so, does that affect your sleep? And if so, does that affect your day? I mean, we're further south than you guys here. Oh, like you, you mentioned being down in tunnels or something like mm. that. Presumably, your actually an office is underground. Yeah, so the, the accelerator is underground. 
um, and the experiments are underground. Yeah, the, even the control rooms are on the surface. In fact, actually, the main reason they built the thing underground was uh, when they when they were planning, they they were digging the tunnel. It was cheaper to dig a 27 kilometer long tunnel underground than it was to buy the land at the surface for the the thing. So you know, um, and also you know, it's it's a bit more. Uh, environmentally friendly because the LHC, when it's running, does produce radiation. But you know, we can shield that with concrete and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's just easier to build, put big concrete blocks underground, and kind of more aesthetically pleasing. Just very quickly, they had well, the time to clear up, but then maybe take a few more questions. And she does have to try to fatigue in the morning. Can't do with the speed of light, so the flight goes very, very good. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I know I'm terrible with names. Like Oh yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay, really nice question. So the question is, um, you know, do we think that in our lifetimes we might see advances <laughs> to the standard model? Uh, the, the answer to that really depends on what the, where the new physics is, right? So when it comes to creating particles inside the LHC, um, again, it's, it's the whole energy mass thing. So energy is like your currency. Right? Energy is the currency of the universe. So you know, at the LHC, we have a certain amount of energy. So with that, we are able to, to you know, go to the standard model shop and then buy like one very heavy particle, or we could buy 100 very light particles, you know, as long as you've got this amount of energy. Um, now, so that was what we were lucky was that the Higgs boson, we discovered it because the Higgs boson mass was in the range that we had enough energy to exchange for a Higgs boson in our collision. Um, so now the question is, let's search for some dark matter particles, where are they? So one possibility is that they are a bit heavier, um, than, so that's why we haven't seen them yet. And then the question is, you know, are they, are they this much heavier? So if we run the LHC for another 20 years, excuse me, we, will we maybe see a small, like a, a little signal of them? Then, cool. Um, but if they are this much heavier, then with running with the LHC, we're not going to, we're not going to have enough energy to create them. So what we have to do is we have to build another bigger accelerator, and one of the plans is to build one that's 100 kilometers long. It will go under Lake Geneva and under the mountains and stuff and, and back again. So you know, then the LHC will feed into that big one. Um, and then, then maybe we'll have enough energy to create some of these dark matter particles here. But if they are this much heavier, then even if we create, if we build a hundred kilometer long collider, we still won't have enough energy to do that. Um, so in terms of, you know, direct searches and seeing a little bump, we really have no idea. Um, on the other hand, neutrinos um, are something that we will see some interesting results. Uh, so the Dune experiment is going to start around 2031. And after about 10 years of running, we should have enough data to be able to say yes or no to the, is this, uh, okay, so fine, that's not necessarily beyond the standard model. 
stuff, but it is it would be really, really interesting to have, you know, to be able to to show this evidence of CP violation. Um, yeah, I you know, it's if if I knew the answer to that question, then I would be talking to the funding agencies right now and making them a lot of promises. Um, but I can't do that. So it's been one of our best question and answering sessions ever. I have a single question. Yeah. <laughs> Just maybe make two quick questions before we wrap up this evening. We had, oh, let's do three. One, two, oh. and then this guy. So, yes. You know what? Mine too. Thank you. But my question is when you look back in your life, your parents, did they have ADHD? Did you see? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my mom may have. Um, I don't know about my dad. My dad passed away in 2015, so you know I can't exactly ask him. Um, yeah, my mom. Uh, I, w in in doing my assessment, obviously I asked my mom a bunch of questions, and you know, my mom was like, "Oh, but I do that too." So I was like, <laughs> "Ah, mom." <laughs> um, so you know, maybe. <laughs> Uh, let's go with you. Now, half of this question is from someone else, um, but hopefully that makes sense. So, I was recently at a talk on cellular biology, and the act of observing um, affects the outcome of a cell as in epigenetics. So, is the act of observing not creative of matter, and the more you look, the more you find? So, you will never actually find because the act of observing creates, creates and consciousness creates matter, not the other way around. So, does the observing affect the outcome? Yes. But in general, it does it in a way that we understand. So one example of this is, I'm just going to do this. One example of this is, um, you know, in, in our detector, uh, as a particle moves through the detector, uh, it, you know, it leaves a signal, but in doing so, it loses a little bit of energy, right? So when we, if, if I'm trying to measure the energy that the particle had at the collision point, I need to take, it, take into account that you know, that particle may have lost a bit of energy by the time it gets to the place that I'm measuring its energy. Um, but luckily, the way that that happens just obeys the laws of physics, and we're able to you know, model that and put that into our computing code so that the code, you know, when, when our computer says, oh, look, here's an electron, this is the energy, we can calibrate that and get the, the correct value. Uh, it, takes a, it takes some work, but it's possible to do. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the consciousness type of question, but... Cool. Um, yeah, so, but the answer is uh, yes you know, measuring a particle or something does affect, does affect the way it, 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 mo it behaves. Yeah, yeah. Observing. yeah, well, observing and measuring are the same thing, because how do you observe, well, it, it's, it's the same thing, right? To observe means you have to interact with it somehow. You're observing me because photons are bouncing off me and going into your eye and sending an electrical signal to your brain. Because, so, you know, that's an interaction. Cool. My dude. Um, I just, you said at the start, like, uh, about, like, you're trying to go so far back as to, like, recreate the Big Bang so you know what happens. But, like, if you end up recreating the Big Bang, would that not like, be really dangerous? No, it would be awesome! <laughs> That's the best question. <laughs> uh, it would be totally awesome. Um, okay. The, oh, sorry. The question was um, I mentioned that one of the things we tried to do is recreate the, the conditions of the Big Bang. So, you know, what if we create the Big Bang? Um, well, you know, lucky for you and everyone else, the energy at the LHC is not actually as much as the energy that created a universe. Uh, so, in fact, in fact even, even there are some particles that are flying and hitting Earth from outer space that have m higher energy than the collisions that we have at the LHC. And, you know, we're still here, so it, it's fine. So is it, uh, <coughs> is it a module replica? 
Oh, sorry? Is it a, is it a way that you're right without what would happen? Um, oh, let me see. So uh, one, one type of thing that we do is instead of just colliding protons, we uh, take lead or gold and we, we smash gold together and you know there's there's a there's a lot of protons and neutrons inside gold or lead right and what happens there is that um, the protons and neutrons sort of like dissociate and you get this kind of soupy soupy stuff called the quark gluon plasma um, and it's like quarks and the gluons and that is that is actually kind of the closest to uh, what the universe was like in the few like, microseconds after the Big Bang with, the, with this quark gluon plasma. Um, but, you know, it exists for a very, very small fraction of a time, and then, as, and then it loses energy and cools, and then we just go back to, to normal stuff. Uh, but one interesting thing that maybe you're also thinking of is uh, one possibility is that we could create microscopic black holes. Um, in fact, you know, back right at the very beginning, there was actually some guy in Hawaii tried to make a lawsuit against CERN to get them to not, build, not start the Large Hadron Collider because he was worried that we would create a black hole that would, you know, eat us all. Um, happy to say that that has not happened. Um, but it would actually be totally cool if it did. Um, <laughs> First things first, if we manage to make a black hole, it would evaporate instantaneously in a puff of particles. Uh, so, you know, no harm done. Um, but actually, the more exciting thing would be seeing it because we actually don't have enough energy to make a microscopic black hole. So if we did, that would tell us that we live in a universe that has you know, extra dimensions and gravity gets stronger as we go smaller and then that's how we actually get enough energy to make a black hole in the first place. So um, yeah, so you know, we haven't seen any black holes yet, but if we do, super cool, <laughs> TLDR. Um, okay. okay, I think that people are, so I actually wanted to say thank you to Ken and I've got a present for you. <laughs> it's fine. But um, so first of all, um, one thing that I didn't realize was that you didn't have ADHD, but I bought you this very, like, very bright LHC launch key keyring. Um, so, you know, maybe gift that to somebody who keeps losing their keys. But most importantly, since you're going to be driving me to the airport at a horrible time tomorrow, um, here's a coffee cup. Remember I said that equation can fit on a coffee cup? This is a coffee cup with the equation on it. So, <laughs> here you go. I wasn't planning this. Yeah. <laughs> Quick quiz, I'm keeping this. <laughs> the answer to live universe and everything. What's the answer for you? Yay! Who said it first? Cheers. Oh, that made it the top of the handle first. <laughs> 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 Awesome. Thank you so much to everyone who joined online as well. And thank you very much to Wilson for all the people who are coming yeah. here. Thanks to the tech guys. Thanks for everyone for coming. Thanks to David. Thanks to Wilson. Thank you for organizing the Wilson Lights Club. And we hope to see you again possibly in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Are we all done? If anybody wants a button with a particle on, I've got like 16, so come and grab one. She's a, there's a particle. Yeah, she's your favorite. Hello, thank you very much. Do you want a button? Maybe just like tear them out, I don't know.